Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, stay at home lecture uh, for um, April. I'm Tim Nutt, Director of the Historical Research Center at UAMS, and glad to have you here uh, tonight. And um, I hope everyone is safe from the tornado and the storms from last week. And um, if you were affected by it, I hope you're, um, you're able to get back on your feet um, soon. And if you, um, and hopefully um, everything is okay with, with everyone. Um, glad to have you here tonight. Um, as you know, the Stay at Home Lecture Series is sponsored by the Society for the History of Medicine and Health Professions, which is the uh, support organization, the Friends Organization for the Historical Research Center. And the Historical Research Center is the archives division of UAMS. And it is um, the really the only dedicated archives in the state that's that, that whose mission is to collect the health and medical related history of Arkansas. And we have a twofold uh, mission at the Historical Research Center. One is that we collect the institutional records uh, the institutional history of UAMS. So anything that deals with the history of the medical center and the medical school, uh, including all the institutes, departments, things like that, we uh, collect. So we're the official repository for the for UAMS records. And then the second part of that is anything dealing with the health and medical related history of Arkansas. So someone from Texarkana or a doctor from Paragould, a uh, hospital from Fort Smith. We're interested in collecting those materials uh, just to tell about the history and the development of uh, medicine in Arkansas. We'd love to have you come down for a tour. If you're ever on the UAMS campus, we collect all types of materials um, such as, um, of course, letters, correspondence, newspaper clippings, photographs, things like that. But also we have a large collection of artifacts since we're a medical uh, archives, um, think of surgical instruments, um, uh, microscopes, things like that. So we'd, I'd love to show you what we have as far as our collection. So if you're ever on campus, please give us a call. Uh, the number's there on your screen. I'd love to give you a tour of our facility. And then I'd also want to encourage you, if you're not a member already, to think about joining the society um, and the dues are relatively inexpensive. They're $15 for an individual, uh, $5 from, for a student. You don't have to be a student uh, at an Arkansas university. You can be uh, somewhere else out of state and still join uh, at the student rate if you're uh, enrolled in school. Uh, the, the link uh, to the membership page is up on your screen. If you'd like to bypass all that, you can just go to PayPal dot me slash shmhp and you can just pay your dues online. Uh, for those who are already members of the society, you will be getting your membership renewal letter uh, in the mail and I hope you will uh, re-up your membership and think about joining at a higher level, perhaps at a sustaining or contri cont uh, contributing level. You're, we also have life and permanent uh, levels as well if you want to consider that. As I mentioned, this is the stay at home lecture series. This is for April and these are held every, the first Thursday of every month from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And every lecture focuses on some aspect of medical or health related history. And next month we have an interesting, um, another interesting topic. It's from Dr. Frank Brown, who uh, is a native of Searcy. And he, he grew up in Searcy. He, he wrote a book uh, entitled Guardian of the Memories of Searcy. Talks about his childhood in uh, Searcy and going to medical school. He currently is the chief quality officer at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta. So that'll be an interesting um, presentation about growing up in a small town, uh, how it was going to coming to Little Rock, going to medical school and, and then sort of tracking his career and how he ended up at, at Emory University. So I hope you'll join us for that. The link for that presentation next month is the same link that you used to join this presentation tonight. It's up on the screen. Looks like it's cut off a little bit on my screen, but hopefully you'll be able to 
um, you have it saved. And of course, um, we always send out uh, email reminders about the presentations. And if you'd like to, if you're not on that email list, you can send me an email or the email at the Historical Research Center, the hrc at uams.edu, and I'll be glad to put you on the list to receive uh, announcements about uh, lectures and special presentations uh, that we have throughout the year. The Society does uh, have other programming besides the stay-at-home lecture series. In the fall, we will have um, our annual dinner and lecture, which will be the first one we've had in in uh, before the pandemic. And um, so that's always a, a fun event where you, we have a lecture and we give out our awards uh, and uh, just have a good opportunity to visit and uh, and have some camaraderie to people who are with people who are also interested in the history of medicine. So hope you'll uh, think about joining the society. Hope you'll think about joining us at future programming, including uh, next month uh, for Dr. Brown and his talk on growing up in Searcy. Tonight, I'm uh, happy to uh, welcome Danielle Afsorda, and she is the community outreach archivist for the Butler Center. Uh, for Arkansas Studies, which is at the Central Arkansas Library System. And um, she received her MA in Public History from UALR and is a certified archivist. She previously worked at the Arkansas State Library, the Arkansas State Archives, and the UA Little Rock uh, Center for Arkansas History and Culture. Her, in her research interests include Arkansas women's history and the built environment. And tonight she's gonna to be talking about Dr. Fred T. Jones, who is a pioneer uh, uh, in healthcare in Little Rock in the, in the early part of the 20th century. So I am going to stop sharing my screen so she can share. And I am going to, there she is. I'm gonna turn off my camera and my audio and turn it over to Danielle. All right. Um, hopefully everyone can see everything okay. Um, as uh, Tim mentioned, um, I am the Community Outreach Archivist for the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. It's a pretty recently created position, um, and I regularly do historical programming through Cal, so if this is of interest to you and something about the way I present this information excites you, feel free to attend all of my other programming. I would love to see more folks there. Um, we advertise that through the Roberts Library Facebook page and on our website. Um, but today I'm going to talk about Dr. Fred T. Jones. I was invited to give this talk because uh, the Butler Center houses uh, Dr. Jones's papers. Um, and prior to my work at the Butler Center, I wasn't actually familiar with Dr. Jones. So I was excited to learn more about him for this presentation. Um, he was a doctor and pioneer in the field of medical insurance in the early 20th century in Arkansas. He navigated the South in an age of Jim Crow and was able to receive the proper education to provide care to Black Southerners during a period of racial violence and segregation in the South, in which Black Arkansans were not entitled to the same care that their white neighbors received. In 1997, Jones's daughter, Mary Jones Griffin, donated Dr. Jones's records and photographs to the Butler Center. I relied on that collection material, the Encyclopedia of Arkansas, and Griffin's biography of her father in preparation for this presentation. Much of his collection has been digitized and is available online. I encourage you to explore the records for yourself to learn more about Dr. Jones's life and legacy. I'll share a link to our digital collections during the Q&A portion at the end of my talk. To give some context for Jones's work in Arkansas, I'd like to bring in some statistics from Edwina Wall's article on Black hospitals in the early 20th century from the Pulaski County Historical Review. In June of 1950, just prior to hospital integration in Arkansas, there were only two hospitals that allowed Black physicians to practice in Little Rock. Additionally, there were only seven hospitals total in the city that admitted Black patients, two of which were owned by Black members of the community. If each hospital had maybe, say, 150 beds, which would be high for the period, there would be only 1,050 available beds for the 19,700 Black residents in Little Rock and 40,000 in Pulaski County. That's an incredible shortage. This was even after the work Dr. Jones did in Little Rock, so you can only imagine how much worse it was before. Prior to Jones's arrival in Arkansas, there was only one black hospital, the Little Rock Colored Infirmary, that operated from 1913 to 1918. Over its short history, it served a black population of over 20,000 and never received official budgetary allowances from the city or the county. 
This was the environment in which Jones began his work in 1918, but we can't th start the story there. To understand Jones's motivations and the true significance of his story, we must return to the beginning of his life. If I can get my slide to progress. <laughs> Fred T. Jones was born on September 8, 1877 in Homer, Louisiana, which if you're unfamiliar with Louisiana's geography like I was, is in the northwestern part of the state. His parents, Fred R. and Harriet, were both born into slavery. After the Civil War, Fred, the son of a white landowner and an enslaved woman, was able to purchase land at 25 cents an acre and establish a farm in Homer with his wife. Fred's pictured here on the top left. And there's a photograph of um, Homer during probably the early 20th century to give you an idea of what it was like. They went on to have 11 children, eight of whom were able to receive a college education. In this 1900 census record, you can see that eight of their children were living at home and their daughter, Eliza, who went by Madge, was attending school while the rest labored on the farm. The photograph on the top left again shows Fred, um, and their oldest son was Fred T. Jones. As a child, his daughter recalls Fred would get up at five o'clock every morning to attend to his farm chores before walking to his school in Claiborne Parish about five miles away. After going to school, there was more farm chores and he would do schoolwork at home after dinner each day. From a young age, Dr. Jones observed the care and treatment of Black members of his community. He recalled his father regularly being called Fed instead of Fred and having to enter the doctor's office from a separate Black and back entrance and wait in the colored waiting room until all the white patients had been treated. These experiences in his childhood helped shape his desire to become a physician and provide health care for the Black community in the South. After finishing his primary schooling in Louisiana, Fred attended college at several universities. First at Bishop College in Marshall, Texas, then at the Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, and ultimately graduated from Branch Normal College in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. During the period, there were not many colleges in the South that accepted Black citizens. Branch Normal College was the only state-supported college for Black students in Arkansas. It was established in 1875 and received federal land-grant funding through the Morrill Act of 1890. Interestingly, it is believed that Dr. Jones graduated between 1900 and 1903, and the 1903 class was the last to receive a bachelor's degree while the school was still called Branch Normal. Another bachelor's degree would not be awarded until the 1930s when it became known as Arkansas AMN. Today, the school is known as the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, which you may be familiar with. After graduating with a bachelor's degree, Jones went on to attend Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. You may wonder why Jones didn't continue his education in Arkansas. For most of the first half of the 20th century, the vast majority of African Americans wanting to become physicians were admitted to two historically Black medical schools, Howard University in Washington, D.C., and Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, with a few admitted through restrictive quotas in schools outside of the South. UAMS, then known as the Medical Department of Arkansas Industrial University, I wanted to make sure I got that right since this is a UAMS lecture, <laughs> did not admit Black students during the period. It would not be until 1948 when Edith Irby Jones was accepted at UAMS that the school would have any Black students. Dr. Jones graduated from Meharry Medical in 1905. After completing his medical training, Jones met and married Katie Chandler of Shreveport, Louisiana in 1907. She's pictured there in the middle. And there's a composite there on the far right, and I wish I could zoom and show you, um, but that's, oh, maybe I can, let me try. There we go. Um, that's Dr. Jones right there. He got, he's been labeled, so that's helpful for finding him in the big old composite. Oh, now I'm not going to be able to get it back to the center, am I? There we go. Great. Um, and then on the left is a photograph of Branch Normal College during the period. After they married, the couple, the couple briefly moved to Huma, Louisiana, pictured on the far left, so that Fred could establish a medical practice there. Reportedly, he saw both white and black patients in his newly established practice, which brought him negative attention from townspeople. Huma was historically dominated by white landowners with over 100 plantations in the surrounding parish. It is likely that Dr. Jones's presence in the community as a black professional was not well received. Quickly, the couple and their young child relocated to Shreveport after white locals repeatedly, uh, reportedly drove him and his family out of town with threats of violence. After relocating to Shreveport, Dr. Jones began working quickly to improve health care there for Black citizens. He set up a practice and began seeing patients. In 1915, he established the first Black hospital in Shreveport, Mercy Sanitarium, which is pictured here in the center. It was later renamed Mercy Hospital. The hospital was located at 925 Pierre Avenue in Shreveport. Jones served as its chief medical officer and surgeon. 
And the photo on the right there shows the Jones family during the time that they lived in Shreveport circa 1915 on a sightseeing tour around town. At the urging of R.A. Williams of Provident Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, Jones moved his family to Little Rock to establish a hospital there. Williams communicated a need for Dr. Jones's services in Little Rock. After opening, after opening his first medical office, Dr. Jones began to build connections in the community. He purchased a home in what is now known as the Dunbar neighborhood at 1855 Cross Street, pictured here on a snowy day. In a citizen's report for the Arkansas Survey newspaper published in 1927, it was noted that when Dr. Jones first moved to Little Rock, he opened one of the best equipped offices, including an x-ray machine, therapeutic arc lamp, and electrical bath cabinet. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd get in something called an electrical bath cabinet, though I have no idea what that is. He advertised his services daily in the Democrat and Gazette through 1917, like the advertisement here on the top left. After a year of independent practice, Jones had the resources and connections to finally establish a hospital. First opened as Booker T. Washington Memorial Hospital, it had an initial $10,000 in capital stock with co-operators Dr. J. M. Robinson, J. O. Hickman, and G. W. S. Ish of the well-known Little Rock Ish family. And the, the hospital was located at 908 Arch. In February of 1918, the hospital was renamed the J.E. Bush Memorial Hospital in honor, in honor of John Edward Bush, the African-American fraternal and political leader who died in Little Rock in 1916. He was the law partner of um, famed attorney Scipio Jones. The um, hospital is pictured here it, um, in August of 1918 and that Oh, I think I took that photo off. I'm sorry, I switched it with the fraternal hospital photograph. So I do not have a picture of the Bush Hospital here. I'm sorry about that. Um, he did remain at the Bush Hospital until 1919. And in that time, he worked to establish his second hospital, the Great Southern Fraternal Hospital that is pictured here. This large advertisement appeared in the Arkansas Gazette on November 20th, 1919. The text below announced that the opening of the new fraternal hospital in Little Rock would be a colored institution for the care and keep of the sick. This hospital had a 100 bed capacity and was located on 816th West 9th Street. The building was initially a two-story frame building, but eventually had a three-story annex added that enabled the facilitation of those 100 patients. The hospital provided medical care for members of two black fraternal organizations, the United Friends of America and the Independent Order of Immaculates. White doctors operated at the hospital along with Jones and, the other, and other black physicians. The United Friends of America was established in Little Rock by Reverend Caleb D. Petaway and Dr. Jones in 1918. The Great Southern Fraternal Hospital operated until 1929. In 1922, the Friends would open their own hospital, employing the same model of care Jones implemented at the Great Southern Fraternal Hospital. The hospital opened initially in 1922 at 714 West 10th Street. It ended up serving from 1922 to 1975, making it the longest continually operating Black hospital in the city. The stability of the hospital was ensured by having just two administrators over its existence, Petaway and Mrs. E. L. Barnes. Additionally, Dr. G. W. S. Ish, who helped establish the Bush Hospital, served as the medical director at the Friends Hospital from its founding until his death in March of 1970. The hospital eventually saw its demise the way many historically Black landmarks did in Little Rock, as the original location was demolished to aid in the construction of I-630 in the 1970s. In the first seven months of, um, of the Southern Fraternal Hospital being open, 118 operations have been performed by physicians such as Dr. Heyman, who was responsible for opening the first hospital that I mentioned in the introduction, Dr. Thornton and Dr. Jones. White surgeons also worked at the hospital. It was first listed in the American Medical Directory in 1925, at which time the annex had not been completed because the hospital only had 40 beds. From 21 to 30, there was a nurse training program there, and it was last listed in the city directory in 1928 and in the American Medical Directory in 1929. Around 1923, Dr. Jones organized the Great Southern Fraternal Union, which had an estimated membership of more than 21,000 by 1927. In 1927, he also organized the Great Southern Investment Company, which was a financial lending institution that aimed at helping black farmers and property owners um, to, to gain equity. 
While working at the Great Southern Fraternal Hospital, Jones assisted in organizing the Great Southern Mutual Life Insurance Company. You can see a trend in naming here, um, which operated until 1926. He was the medical director for that company, insuring Black Arkansans. It was absorbed in 1926 by Universal Life of Memphis, which at the time was one of the largest insurers for Black Americans. After it was absorbed, he continued to serve as the medical director for the larger company. Using his experience in insurance, as well as his experience as a hospital administrator, Jones popularized the concept of the hospital plan, which was essentially an early medical insurance plan. Subscribers would pay monthly dues amounting between $6 and $18 per year, depending on covered services, to offset future hospital visits. In 1920, he cop copyrighted the Fraternal Benevolent Charity and Hospital Plan that applied his practice to fraternal orders and charity organizations. Um, there's a photograph of the cover of the plan there. If you'd like to read the whole thing, it is available in our digital collections. Um, in his introduction, he clearly explains why he felt this was necessary, saying, having had years of experience as a physician and surgeon and seeing hundreds and thousands of poor people suffer and finally die for want of hospital treatment they are unable to get, I decided to inaugurate a hospital plan by which each and every member of a fraternal, benevolent, charity, or insurance company could, for a small fee, have their way paid through such institutions when they are in need of treatment. With the above idea in view, I have very successfully operated the Fraternal Hospital on West Ninth Street in Little Rock for quite two years with great good accomplishment. It's hard to know why the hospital ceased functioning in 1929, whether it was the subscription model couldn't hold up during the Depression, or perhaps external forces forced its closure. There's no documentation that discussed why it ended. There, was also, there were also racial factors at play in Little Rock during the period that had a great effect on the Black community as a whole in Little Rock. Jones's family was not excluded. Jones ended up moving his family to Chicago in May of 1927 after the lynching of John Carter, a Black man accused of assaulting a young white girl in front of his, in, in the lynching occurred in front of the hospital on 9th Street. Carter's lynching had lasting effects on the Black community. Many families, like the Joneses, no longer felt safe in Little Rock because of threats of continued violence. Fearing for his family's safety, Jones sent his wife and six of his children out of state until tensions eased. According to his daughter, armed white men followed the family's car on its way out of Little Rock. Jones remained in the city to continue to provide medical care to the area's Black citizens, even though he was also threatened with violence. His wife and three youngest children did end up returning to Arkansas in 1937. After the closure of the Great Southern Fraternal Hospital, Jones established the Great Southern Hospital in Pine Bluff, which is located in Jefferson County, in 1932. After a year and some 200 successful operations there, the resentment of some white citizens forced jo Jones to once again return to Little Rock. Afterward, he and Dr. Lonnie Root organized the Southern Hospital as Association in North Little Rock in 1933. He served as the chief surgeon at the hospital until his own death in 1938. A separate Jones Brother Laboratory at 1311 Broadway in North Little Rock was operated by Jones and his son Booker. It manufactured and distributed prescription medicines in the area to pharmacies like the Jim Pharmacy, Children's Drug Store, and Floyd Drug Store, all on West Ninth. Jones served as president of the Arkansas Medical, Dental, and Pharmaceutical Association in 1934 as an, and as an officer in the National Medical Association. He was a very skilled surgeon and is known to have had accepted payment from rural patients in the form of chickens, eggs, and vegetables. He committed his life to making a change in the treatment of the Black community and improving their health care. He was also active in civic, business, and religious affairs in Little Rock, including the Black Chamber of Commerce, which Jones helped to establish. He died on September 10, 1938 in Little Rock, and he is buried at Haven of Rest Cemetery. His life is representative of many who fought to improve conditions for the Black community during the period. To highlight some of that work, I wanted to also share about two other 20th century medical practitioners who helped improve the life for Black citizens in Little Rock and were undoubtedly touched by jo Dr. Jones's work. First, I wanted to discuss Frank B. Coffin. He was born on January 12, 1870 in Holly Springs, Mississippi, to Samuel and Josephine Barton Coffin. He attended Rust College in his hometown of Holly Springs from 1886 to 1887. He earned a PhD degree from Fisk University in Nashville in, in 1890 and a pharmaceutical degree from Meharry in 1893. He borrowed train fare to Little Rock and moved to Arkansas. His name first appears in Little Rock City Directory in 1895. 
He obtained a license to practice pharmacy in Arkansas after passing the necessary exam and worked in the pharmacy business at George E. Jones Drug Company at 700 West 9th. On January 1st, 1898, he purchased the business and became a sole proprietor. Jones, whose wife had been a classmate of Coffin, sold him the building and loaned him $150 worth of medicine to get started. His business became known as the Children's Drug Store around 1928. You may remember that because Jones sold medication from his pharmaceutical company to Coffin um, at the Children's Drug Store. He tutored children in the community with their homework assignments after school. His business was very popular with the neighborhood children because of the soda fountain and candy. Thus, his motto, follow the children to the Children's Drug Store. I don't know how well that motto would go over in the 21st century. In 1902, Coffin married Josie Petty, a teacher in Little Rock. And uh, there are no records of a divorce or her death, but he, he married a second time to Lottie E. Woodford of Lexington, Kentucky. The couple's home was at 1118 Izzard Street in the same neighborhood um, that the Joneses lived in. And the land the home was on is now part of the campus of Philander Smith College. He published his first book of poetry, Coffin's Poems and Ajax's Ordeals in 1897. His poetry reflected a fondness for children and his mother, as well as romantic love. He offered insight into the troubles of racism and wrote admiring verse about Harriet Beecher Stowe, Frederick Douglass, and Abraham Lincoln. He died in 1951 at the United Friends Hospital, and his funeral arrangements were taken care of by the undertakers. Um, the United Friends, which help, Jones helped found, um, had the motto, we serve in life, we serve in death. In addition to hospital services, they also provide provided funeral services. He's also buried at Haven of Rest. There seems to be a historical thread in the development and facilitation of Black medical care in Arkansas in the 20th century. Another actor that I wanted to talk about is Lena Lowe Jordan. Um, Lena, uh, Lena's papers are actually at uh, the UAMS Historical Research Center. She was a registered nurse and hospital administrator who managed two Black medical institutions and trained young Black nurses in Little Rock. She was born in 1884 in Georgia to Holland and Martha Lowe and trained to become a nurse at Charity Hospital of Savannah. She married Peach Jordan, who was an official of the Mosaic Templars Fraternal Organization and moved to Little Rock in the 1920s. She began her career as a registered nurse as the head of the Mosaic State Templars Hospital in 1927. In the 30s, she was affiliated with the Arkansas Home and Hospital for the Crippled Negro Children in Little Rock. She placed a mortgage on her own home to obtain funds to operate the hospital. The date the institution became a general hospital is unclear, but it was named the Lena Jordan Hospital by 1938. It was initially located at 1500 Pulaski, but relocated to 16th and Chester in the home pictured here that previously belonged to J.E. Bush, for which the other hospital was named, and remained there until 1953. This hospital had 20 beds for general surgery, medical, and obstetrics. It was open to all Black patients regardless of their ability to pay. The physicians who served on the staff, both black and white, did so without pay for, for those who could not afford it. Jones began an innovative program for training nurses at the hospital. She provided room, board, clothes, and a small salary. In 1934, she partnered with the Red Cross to provide training for 91 black women in in-home nursing. She spent 30 years of her career in Little Rock providing care for the underserved black community and died on September 30th, 1950. She is also buried at Haven of Rest in Little Rock and she and her husband lived at 2424 Ringo, also in Dunbar, which is unfortunately now a vacant lot. This photograph is from the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences Historical Research Center, um, which I mentioned houses Jordan's papers. In the age of Jim Crow, the primary forces behind providing social services to Black Arkansans was Black fraternal organizations. Four of the Black hospitals that operated in Little Rock during the period were founded and operated by these fraternal organizations. They provided health insurance in an era predating the same services for white members of the community. They were pioneering in this regard, but suffered from financial difficulties because they were not profitable and did not receive public funding. These institutions served as places of care, learning, and services to their community, as they were also some of the only places that Black nurses could receive training in the segregated society. Once integration legislation came to pass in the 50s and 60s, these hospitals eventually lost all of their financial support. The Civil Rights Act was noted as being a death warrant for the remaining Black hospitals in the South. As we are seeing now with statistics about care for Black patients in the 21st century and infant mortality and maternal mortality for Black mothers, there's perhaps still a need for the specific care. 
Even today, the work of Dr. Jones and his contemporaries has a lasting legacy that continues the, to shape the future of healthcare for Arkansas and beyond. Thanks. And, uh, oh, let me actually share my slide because it has my contact information on it, and that seems good. So let me share that real quick. And if anyone has any questions. If anyone does have any questions, please use the uh, chat feature. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat and uh, Danielle will be happy to answer those, I bet. <clears throat> I know I'm a fast talker, so, and I threw a lot of dates out there. <laughs> you know, the, uh, really in, in Little Rock, the, um, you know, thanks to Dr. Jones and uh, Dr. Ish and uh, Frank Coffin and others like him, you know, they're, the African American community really had excellent health care uh, in the early part of the 20th century, and they would have not have been able to get it anywhere else, as you mentioned during your talk. Absolutely. And I think that Dr. Jones's model for using the fraternal organizations to sort of funnel the insurance through um, was like ingenious and then ended up kind of being adopted across the state by all of these fraternal organizations that were establishing hospitals. Yeah. So I think that's really important to mention. Yeah, and, and you know, it's really, Dr. Jones was, he was such an important figure and I'm glad the Butler Center is preserving his, his papers. And thankfully his daughter, um, you know, saved all the all these materials and donated them to the Butler Center because um, otherwise, you know, that history would be lost if she hadn't done that. We had, do have a question. Are Coffin's books of poetry at the Butler Center at, at, or at UAMS? That's a good question. Let me do a quick, let me paste this first. So this is an ugly URL, but this will get you to um, all of the digitized content from uh, the Jones collection. Let me check on if we have any of Coffin's books. No, if UAMS has any copies of, of, of um, Coffin's books, um, but um, I need to be looking, if we don't, I need to be looking for them and add them to the collection because uh, I always thought that Ajax, what was the name of that poems and uh, Coffin's poems with Ajax ordeals. We do have a copy of that in the collection. And we also have Factum Factorum, which is another of his poetry books. So we have both of those in the collection. Yeah. Um, and it, go sorry, no, go oh, I, I was just going to explain an access policy thing. So both of these books are very old, obviously, and we only have one copy. So um, you just have to sign a form to view them in the research room, but they are definitely in there. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, Coffin, he, his, the titles of his poetry or poems are, are always so interesting, like Ajax's Ordeals and Factum Factorum, you know. It's yes. just, he must have just been an interesting, interesting, he was an interesting, interesting person. Yeah, I felt like, like I said, I feel like some of his slogans wouldn't go over very well in the 21st yeah. century. But um, but I imagine at the time, you know, in the community on West Ninth, that it was uh, very integral to have someone doing doing that work before we had sort of, he was sort of manifested an after school program for these kids. Right. So, right. Um, yeah. And it's such a shame that um, the buildings, the hospitals and the house and the homes that the the doctors and, and coffin and and the others lived in were destroyed because of six mainly of when six thirty was put in. Yeah, I like to mention what happened to these properties because I think it's important for people to realize that um, whenever you talk a, a lot of times, not always, but whenever you talk about um, the history of white movers and shakers in Little Rock, typically those structures are still there because they had the power to preserve them, but. Um, these folks, by the time urban renewal programs were happening, didn't have representation, um, and they weren't able to to preserve their communities, unfortunately. So a lot of these homes were raised through blighting programs. So. And it's also interesting, you noted that, um, well, we have a question. In your research, did you run into Dr. Oba White or Dr. Morris Jackson? I am not familiar with either of those names, no. Now I'm wondering if they were in Little Rock and who they were. <laughs> um, I, I'm not familiar with Oba White. Do you mean uh, uh, Obi White, Sam? 
the one at the uh, McRae Sanatorium. I'm going to unmute you, Sam. <laughs> Maybe. Am I unmuted now? No, you're. We hear you now. Okay. I don't. I don't. I. I. I thought it was over white. I, I thought it was over white, but uh, but it may be Obi white. But uh, Amos Schutte interviewed him, and you have the you have interviews for Dr. White there at the UMS. Anyway, yeah, I mean, he's he was a really he was instrumental in the desegregation, uh, the medical desegregation of for the physicians of Baptist and St. Vincent's in, oh, the, okay. in the mid 1950s. In the mid 1950s, so this is after these guys you're talking about, and so mm -hmm. was Morris, and so was Morris Jackson. Uh, okay. Morris Jackson. Morris Jackson, both they came along. They came along in the 50s and 60s, but they were very instrument. They carried forward what these fellows did, what Dr. Jones and his and his crew of people did. Hmm. Uh, but I thought I thought it was over white, but I hell I don't know. Well, <laughs> you you might be right. You're usually. Um... Um, you usually are right, Sam. Um, we have another the question. Interviews, the interviews that Amos Schutte did of Dr. White, uh, they're in, in the, in the, it was done, they were done in the 1970s, and they're there at UMS, and they are excellent. They are just beautiful, beautiful. Now, he did two different interviews with him, and, they're, and the transcripts are just wonderful. Well, and, you know, those are available to look at or to, and, uh, uh, I don't know what format they're in, but they're, they probably, they've been transcribed, I'm assuming, since yeah. you... Um, their paper. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're paper copies, I saw. Uh, yeah. So we might not have the audio copies, but anyone's, uh, is, uh, those are available to look at, for anyone to look at, if you want to come to UAMS, the Historical Research Center, and, and uh, look at those. We do have another question. Did um, Dr. Jones ever retire? If so, what did he do in his later years? So. Um historians are very good at quick math as long as it's subtracting to find out when someone died um so dr jones was unfortunately only in his young 60s when he passed away and he was still working at the hospital in north little rock when he died and um kind of in a in a love story sort of way he actually died just two months after his wife katie um so it might have been a broken heart hard to say but and uh, we have another question. What agency would be responsible for placing markers for these historical sites of early black pioneers in Little Rock? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if any of them are on any of the walking tours already. Um, they wouldn't be on the civil rights one probably, but um, that's a good question. I think it would be, it would be worth pursuing. Um, it, a lot of that's been facilitated in the past through specific marker programs through commissions formed by the state government. Um, so I'm not sure how that would work on a local level. I've only ever seen ones put out by, you know, the Sesquicentennial Commission for the Civil War and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. I know the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, they used to have a marker program, but I think that was like related to the governor's like gubernatorial governor's houses and mm. things like that. So, so that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's something that we can look into. I bet that might be even a great grant opportunity to get. Yeah, it would up. be good to recognize some of the stuff, especially because a lot of it was on West Ninth and in Dunbar and, and there is no physical footprint left anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned um, uh, Dr. Jones was president of the, um, pharmaceutical, medical, pharmaceutical, and dental uh, association. And that, you know, that itself, that organization has an interesting history. It was founded in the mid 1890s. And it was because um, the Arkansas Medical Society didn't admit black physicians into it. So they started their own organization and that still exists today as well. Oh, wow. in Arkansas, so. He was involved in so many things that I didn't get a chance to dig into at all, but yeah. um, he was really, and he had an entire um, part of his life where he was like, he was deeply religious and very involved in the church to, um, I believe he was a Baptist. Um, yes, he was a Baptist. I was like, I don't want to mess that up. Um, yeah, and that was very important and informed, informed a lot of his work too, and I'm sure his, his heart for charity, so. I, uh, I knew his daughter. Marie Jones Griffin. 
And yes, I was going to ask if we had time, if you could tell the story of meeting her and getting the collection, since you're the uh, one who got the collection when you were yeah, at the Butler Center. I'm, I'm glad before it was the Butler Center. It was, um, uh, you know, that's one of my uh, sort of the highlights of my career is getting that collection. And she she wrote a biography of her father, um, and I can't off the top of my head, I can't remember the title of the book. It's something like Trailblazer, I think. Yeah, uh, I believe it is um, something a black trailblazer. I. I just had it on my desk today, but it, I know it's like a true it's librarian. One of those, it's one of those books that doesn't leave the library, you know. So, um, and like a true will, librarian, it's green. I know it's green. It is. It is green. <laughs> but uh, so she had written that book, and at the time, I was working for, um, or I was with the, um, I was doing like book edit or book reviews for the Pulaski County Historical Review, and that book came in, and so I did a review of it. And I wrote her, sent her a copy of the review, and really got to know her. And she was such a nice person. And so I happened, they lived, she and her husband lived in Chicago. And, uh, and so when I was in Chicago for a conference, I went by to visit her. And she and her husband lived on like the, an upper level floor on this, in this condo that overlooked Lake Michigan. And it was, a, you know, just a wonderful, wonderful view. And she and her husband, Harry, were so nice. And they, I had dinner with them at their condo. And she loved talking about her father. And she was so proud of everything that he had accomplished. And she was so proud that his papers were preserved at the Butler Center. And um, they were just really, really, really nice people. And her husband, Harry, um, worked for NASA, I believe. At some oh, wow. Time. He was like a astrophysicist or something like that um but um unfortunately i lost touch with them um but uh, they were really really nice folks and um, they were I, i'm uh, glad that i i met them and uh, were friends with them because uh, they were really really great great people that's wonderful but you know co collections like that you know that's that's sort of a serendipitous uh, collection because no one would have ever known about that collection had she not written the book and you know sent a copy for it to be reviewed yeah uh, yeah so it just you know things like ha that happen and, and we're so you know we're all so much better because of serendipitous uh, events like that yeah and I think it's one of the only archival collections with the exception of Lena Jordan's that exists from these folks so um, that were doing all of this work in the early 20th century. So it's, right. it's really great that that it exists and that it's preserved. Um, yeah. And it's inter interesting, you mentioned um, them leaving in 1927 after the, the lynching of um, John Carter. And that, you know, a lot of the, um, many people in the black community left Little Rock uh, because mm -hmm. of that. Florence Price, who was the uh, composer uh, lived in Little Rock, and after that horrific event in, in 1927, uh, she moved to Chicago, and she that's where she and her husband, um, Thomas Price, who also was a partner with Scipio Jones, uh, yes. they lived uh, in Chicago for the rest of their lives. Um, so it was just that, you know, that was just such a horrific event, and it, it you know, it decimated the African-American community because there was such an exodus of... Mm -hmm the educated physicians and, and composers and teachers and, and uh, you know, all these professionals left the city and it really, it really hurt the city uh, uh, because of that exodus. Absolutely. Um, if we don't have any other questions, um, I'll thank everyone for, for being here tonight. I appreciate it. And Danielle, thank you for being here and giving us a little insight into Dr. Jones's collection. And I encourage everyone to go down to the Butler Center uh, if you're interested in learning more about Dr. Jones and uh, looking at that collection or look, checking out the digital collection. I'm so glad that y'all were able to digitize that. Yeah, a, pretty, not all of it, but a lot of it has been digitized now. So um, it's, which is nice because a lot of it was fragile too, so. Yeah, yeah. so uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you all for being here. Hope you'll join us next month and uh, we'll hear Dr. Frank Brown talk about growing up in Searcy. So y'all everyone stay safe and uh, happy Easter and we'll, we will see you next month.